Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this our penultimate debate of term. Apologies, apologies, apologies for running so late. Um, it's all entirely our fault, so I can only apologize for that. Since we are running a little bit late, I'm going to try and be as brisk as possible with uh, the preliminaries. Just running through the basic rules, you should hopefully have a sense of how it operates by now, but I will explain it anyway because that's my job. Um, the motion for the house is this house believes the left is losing its way. We're going to start with 10, uh, 10 minute speech from Gabriel, uh, then we're going to have 10 minutes from Aaron, then we'll go to a round of floor speech as ever in, in the floor speech. You have the right to attend the post-dinner drinks reception, so it's an incentive for you all. Then we will go to 10 minutes from Flora, 10 minutes from Owen, round of floor speeches, 10 minutes from Eddie, and 10 minutes to finish off from Patrick. Uh, you, of course, have the right to intervene at any point by standing up and saying on that point. And I've encouraged, as ever, the speakers to take ample points. So do stand up and have your voice heard. It's a debate, not several voices talking past each other. Very well, so we will, we will begin with our first speaker on the proposition, Gabriel Osborne. Gabriel is a first year historian at Trinity College, Cambridge. He won this slot through an open audition held earlier this week. Gabriel, the floor is yours. Right. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I feel very privileged to be here and uh, speak on behalf of the proposition this evening on issue, which I'm sure is, all, is dear to, to all of us. Now, I do certainly believe that if the left has not yet lost its way, then its moral decline is already in motion. And by the left, I refer mainly to the hard left forming part of the British Labour Party. If we judge the hard left by their own standards, they have lost their way. But first, let me clarify my approach to the question. I have strong views on political and party policy, but on those views, I'm less keen to focus tonight. For from the Fabians and the Marxists, Harold Wilson and Tony Benn, Neil Kinnock, and shame he's not here, Derek Hatton, the Labour Party, the Labour movement, the left, has been made up of diverging views. Watching Life of Brian and noting the return of many members from the Labour past to the current front line of politics, can tell us that ideological conflict is perhaps the normal way for the left. But we come together, despite our differences on the left, to fight for a more inclusive society, a more equal society, and a more prosperous Britain. The problem is not ideological discord, it is the search for ideological purity. The problem lies with those who wish to stamp the other side out. So tonight, I do not want to focus on party policy as such, but on the mindset of the current regime which dominates the Labour Party and many of its supporters amongst the membership. In 2015, Jeremy Corbyn's pitch for the Labour leadership was based on an optimistic vision. He wanted to create a more inclusive party, a more inclusive country, a, as we were told, new kind of politics. And Corbyn was, crucially, a good man who would come and clean up the gutter politics of Westminster. It was to be the most noble, well-intentioned revolution. And the parallels can be drawn between this optimism and the optimism sweeping Bernie Sanders' movement, our revolution. But there, I think, we encounter the problem. For within that phrase, our revolution, there lies a dichotomy between the inclusivity of our and the conflict implicit in that word, revolution. For it assumes that we all have a homogeneous notion of the kind of politics and better society that we want to create. Therefore, when we encounter dissent, we assume that our opponents must disagree with us with malign intent, for ours is the moral way. Thus, in pursuit of the utopia we crave, we abandon the integrity of the individual and pluralism of moral conviction. And thus, as Montaigne feared, in trying to make themselves into angels, men transform themselves into beasts. There can surely be no doubt that it is far harder to nurture the flower of unity than it is to sow the seeds of division. But it is my fear that left, the left's patch, particularly that of the Labour Party, is currently rank and unweeded. And I want to focus 
on a few issues briefly within the British Labour Party which show hypocrisy and that the left has lost its way. So let me begin with the claim made in 2015 that the left has its principles and defends them, as opposed to that mysterious entity, the evil Blairite neoliberal centre. This was big when Corbyn first came to the helm of the Labour Party because the word unelectable was often thrown his way. But we were told it was far better to lose with your principles than sell out to the evil Washington consensus just to get into power. Now, where do we stand today? With Labour on the threshold of power, Corbyn knocking at the doors of number 10 and giving Larry the cat little treats on the, on the down low, but we also have members of the Labour Party, MPs such as Margaret Hodge and Chakaru Mana, being harassed by party members, accused of trying to sabotage Labour's election hopes in this evil conspiracy for doing what Jeremy Corbyn has been praised for doing his entire political career, and that is standing up for their principles, the causes in which they believe, irrespective of whether that conforms to the Labour Party line or no. Does this sound like an inclusive party? Does it sound like an inclusive movement? And ask yourselves, if this division and vitriol is so prevalent, does it matter that Jeremy Corbyn is a good man? Now let me move on to the unfair criticisms leveled against Mr. Corbyn for appearing on platforms with unsavory types. He's accused of being a terrorist, a communist, an anti-Semite. Now, however wrong it may have been, for members in the press and in the general public to find Mr. Corbyn guilty by association for being at rallies with certain undesirable individuals, there is definitely a hypocrisy. Because recently we saw Labour MPs marching in Westminster with their colleagues in solidarity against anti-Semitism in Britain and across the world. Members of the DUP provocatively joined this March, and as a result, that same week, Labour MPs were harassed and bullied by many local party members from the hard left for marching with the DUP. Does this not sound like hypocrisy to you? Does this not sound like tainting, tainting by association? When my local MP, Thangham Debonair in Bristol West, is heckled to such an extent at our local meeting that she is put to tears and has to flee the meeting, does this not sound like madness? when all she was doing was trying to combat racism in our society. So ask yourselves once more, does it matter that Jeremy Corbyn is a good man when he does not stamp out this vitriol in the party? Now, our last point, I want to turn to the de democratization, so-called, of the Labour Party and the Labour movement. For surely in this, you might think, good intentions cannot be lost. Surely the distribution of power must be a good thing. And it would certainly seem that there is a majority for reform amongst Labour members themselves. Yet, look closer, and plans to democratise the, par the party would in fact weaken parliamentary democracy which underpins British society and has already soured our politics. It has become a battle between the so-called grassroots, which you may think constitutes loyal Labour members for the past decades who have campaigned tirelessly, but it in fact only denotes in the eyes of the hard left those who are loyal to the Labour leadership. And this spurious idea of mandatory reselections. Let's call it what it is, ladies and gentlemen. It is deselections. That is what is going on here. And so, does that sound like a party that is inclusive to you? Does it sound like a party ready to unite a country so divided over Brexit at the moment? Our chance of deselect shouted at my local MP, examples of the kind of politics. And in claiming to have a monopoly over representation in the party, over democracy, over truth? Is the hard left not, in fact, resembling the right-wing, hard Brexiter, Tory ideologues that we want so rightly to remove from power? So for the final time, I ask, with all this division, with all this victory, all this hatred, I'm search for ideological purity, does it matter that Corbyn is a good man? For where were his condemnations of his friend Len McCluskey and his cabal when they staged a very questionable plot against Gerard Coyne for the head of the United Union? Where is his action and condemnation over the vitriol online and the abuse that flows like liquid anthrax through the Labour Party's veins? Will he speak up when, like the Girondins, we see the Jacobin purge their opponents when the transition from angels to Montaigne's beasts is complete? Surely we cannot accept this. Leave any notions of noble intentions aside, as history has taught us, from the French to the Russian Revolution. Ends do not always justify means. Actions do mean more than words, and do not bad people flourish when the good do nothing. 
The Labour and the left should be fighting for that inclusive society and party, but for too many on the left, this does not seem to be the goal. When the public, like the MPs before them, show dissent, what will be next? Deselect the voters? By that time, Jeremy Corbyn being a good man will mean nothing. So I beg you to support the motion tonight. Thank you very much. Gabriel, before we move on to our second speaker, two quick things. Um, I know lots of you are following us on the live stream. You can contact me and I will read out tweets at hashtag cuss left, um, C-U-S left. I will also probably respond more quickly to Facebook messages to the page since it's easier for me to get them on my battled old phone. Um, there's also a hearing loop available for you all, so if you're hard of hearing, uh, do tune into that. That frequency should be available for you all. We move on now to our second speaker in tonight's debate for the, op the first for the opposition, Aaron Bastani. Uh, Aaron is a left-wing journalist and vocal supporter of Corbynism. He's the co-founder and senior editor of Novara Media, a digital media company seeking to break the mold of British journalism. Uh, he's prominent on Twitter and has written for publications such as Vice, the Guardian, and Open Democracy. Aaron. Can I move this? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I would have thought in such an esteemed place of learning you would have added Dr. Aaron Mastani, but my mistake. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to extend my gratitude for your very kind invitation to speak here this evening on this motion. Uh, the motion in question is relatively straightforward. This House believes the left has lost its way. And the first thing I've always tried to impress on students is answer the question. So before we begin, let's examine by what we mean when we say the left. I take it to mean those political and cultural forces which avow and seek to extend an explicitly socialist politics, be it through trade unions, political parties, or other forms of organizations such as magazines, newspapers, or local groups. I take this as a relatively innocuous and uncontested term. Furthermore, I would submit, as I'm sure you would, that the Labour Party, especially under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn and a number of actors within its orbit, fall under this category. Furthermore, we need to be clear about where we are referring to. So, for the sake of brevity, I will take it that we are referring to Britain and in concentric circles moving out to Europe and the Anglophone world. And I must start, before I proceed, with the declaration. I find the idea of the left moving in a negative direction at this point in these places to be patently absurd. In fact, it's so absurd, I think it's more a matter of conjecture for people more concerned with hyperbole than facts and empiricism, and I say that as a social scientist. So let's start with the facts. In 2015, the Conservatives won their first majority since 1992. Perhaps even greater concern to progressives was that UKIP won four million votes in the meantime. Over the decades, progressives have often said to themselves, if only we had a system of proportional representation, then we would have a perpetual government with progressive interests at its heart governing at Westminster. Except, in 2015, that was not true. UKIP and the Unionist parties of the occupied six counties, along with the Conservatives, combined more than 50% of the popular vote. That had not happened in generations. Alongside that, Labour lost 40 seats in Scotland to the SNP, being reduced to a solitary constituency in the very nation where it was founded. Nationally, Ed Miliband polled 30%, far below expectations. But don't be too harsh on Ed, because actually, that was a distinct improvement on five years earlier, when Labour won 29% of the vote in the 2010 general election. But even that, which was the second worst performance in Labour's modern history, wasn't the nadir under Gordon Brown, because that came a year earlier in the European elections, when Labour came sixth in the southwest region for the European elections. Would you like to know who beat them? The Tories, the Liberal Democrats, 
the Greens, <laughs> UKIP, and Merbian Canal, campaigning for an independent Cornwall. Yes, things were that bad. Now, I don't mean to blame that all on Gordon Brown. Two things were happening. First, Labour was in the final stages of a 15-year electoral cycle, where it steadily, and some might argue inevitably, lost support. It had lost 6 million votes between 1997 and 2010. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it had failed to adequately respond to the global financial crisis of 2008, with the frame of austerity prevailing. Now, if you have to answer the questions that your enemy is posing, you're almost certain to lose, which perhaps explains why I'm here right now. Because I'm defending a question I think couldn't be more ridiculous. Now, contrast this electorally with Jeremy Corbyn. Last year, Labour increased their share of the vote by 9.6%, the largest increase for any party since Labour in 1945. Winning 12.8 million votes, they outperformed Brown in 2010 and Tony Blair in 2001 and 2005, all facing far greater hostility from the media and an unprecedented level of party disunity. Most importantly, this happened on the back of a manifesto which was overtly socialist. In it included promises such as the scrapping of tuition fees, the nationalisation of public utilities, increasing the minimum wage, building social housing, and increasing taxes on corporations and the very rich. Last year, proportionally, parties that were progressive prevailed once more. And while often London-based Corbyn sceptics like to decry the party as too metropolitan, in England, Labour's performance was even better, equaling that of Tony Blair in 1997. I'm from a place which is true blue, Bournemouth. Their Labour won 35 and 36 percent last year. They more than doubled their vote on the two years earlier. Even under Blair in 1997, Labour got 20 and 21 percent in Bournemouth. And in assessing the new national mood, places like Bournemouth matter as much as the fact Labour deprived the Tories of their governing majority at Westminster. On that point, um, I just, if we're Assessing the national mood, surely the word Brexit has to feature at some point. I just wonder well, how important you think that was in getting Corbyn's vote as opposed to the manifesto, which seemed a bit like a fudge to me. As you might gather, I'm trying to answer the question, okay. unlike others. Um, alongside this, Labour has its largest membership in decades and the second largest of any party in Europe. It is generating greater revenues than the Tories and last weekend polled far higher than the government. And I say that in the knowledge that with any election campaign, such a lead will only be extended. So enough of Britain. I think the statistics there speak for themselves. Let's move to the United States. There, the Democratic Socialists of America have a membership of 52,000, an all-time high, and recently gained two members of the United States House of Representatives with the election of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib. That comes on the back of the Bernie Sanders primary campaign of 2015-16, when, starting as an outsider, he went on to amass more votes than any other Democratic candidate in a primary other than Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. What is more, and this is the great tragedy, perhaps, of this decade, according to a Reuters poll from the 22nd March 2016, Donald Trump was set to beat Hillary Clinton by 1%, while Bernie Sanders would have won by 14%. All of these electoral shifts are reflected in public attitudes, both in the UK and the US. We now see clear majorities for things like nationalisation and public ownership. 74.18 to control energy prices. 72.19 for public transport. 68.21 for the nationalisation of rail. And 66.23 for energy. That's been compounded by more sophisticated data recently gathered by the IPPR with Sky. 84% back regulating companies like Facebook and Google in a similar way to broadcasters. 63% support making it compulsory to have workers on boards. 60% back the Bank of England, and this is incredible, to adopt policies to keep house prices from rising. Clearly, something has decisively changed in the country. Furthermore, and I'll finish with this, more people identify as socialist than they have than at any time in my life. According to a February 2016 poll for YouGov, the British had a better view of socialism than of capitalism. 
18 to 64s had a net positive view of socialism, with this increasing amongst the young. While the over 65s may have had a negative view of socialism, they also had a net negative view of capitalism. This was echoed in a poll just this August in the United States, where Gallup isolated how 47% of Democrats view capitalism positively, down 10% from two years ago. Meanwhile, 57% of Democrats view socialism favorably. So there's a clear trend. Over time, and by age demographic, socialism is becoming more popular. Socialist policies are becoming more popular. And socialist politicians are more successful than even I dared imagine just a few years ago. Compare this to the parties who made historic compromises with neoliberalism, and I'm happy to define what that is. Privatization, weak trade unions, weak labor markets, uh, loose monetary policy. In Greece, PASOK got 40% of the vote in 2009, before winning just 47 in January 2015. In France, Bernard Armand, the Parti Socialiste candidate, won 6.3% of the vote in the first round. In Italy, in their general election this year, the Partito Democratico won just 19% of the vote. It's clear that the basis of historic social democracy is vanquished. Only the radical left can answer the great challenges of our time, from climate change to societal aging and automation. Friends, I would submit that the last two years show us very clearly that after decades, Britain and elsewhere across the planet is showing a left that is ready and able and rising to the great challenges and opportunities that confront us over the course of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bastani. Um, we're going to move on now to a round of floor speeches. Um, I'm going to go round, I'll try and do it just once this time, then probably twice for the second round of floor speeches. So if you would like to speak in proposition of motion, can you put your hand up and see your name and your college? I'm going to go down to the uh, person down here in grey. So if you could wait for a microphone to get to you, that'd be fabulous. Hi, I just wanted to point out that I take a few, uh, yeah, I'd like to contend some of the points just made in the last speech. So firstly, um, although, I mean, polls might have changed, I'm happy to concede that, but actually, um, when Labour had their conference in 2018 in Brighton, like, polls showed that support for Corbyn and lots of his policies has drastically gone down um, compared to the party Corbyn's image seemed to have suffered in the last year. I mean, I, I recognise that during the election, his image was really revitalised. So a lot of people seemed to place a lot of trust in him. But that, that sort of seemed to have changed for some reason, maybe with the um, claims of anti-Semitism or the claims that the proposition speaker um, gave with, concerning how sort of infiltrated the party has become by extremists. Um, my second point is in regard really to how the sort of the Corbyn, uh, the Corbynist sort of labor movement seems been founded mostly on moral principles. In your argument, you gave kind of a lot of um, sort of factors relating to pra uh, the practicalities of what the Labour Party would do and the policies it would implement. But essentially, um, according to an Economist um, article during the, uh, that was made during the general election last year, Corbyn was elected mainly because of his principles, because people found him more kind of morally authoritative than May and the other party leaders. But then the fact is that even, um, the, even though he knows this is his main appeal, and so do lots of other Labour Party activists, he's failed to kind of act on those so many times. The proposition speaker gave lots of examples of this. Um, I think the time, I mean, I used to be a massive Corbyn supporter, but then I remember the, day, the very day when I turned off him, and that was when I found out that in relation to the attacks on people protesting in Venezuela, when the government killed over 100 people per opposition um, pr uh, politi uh, politicians, essentially, in prison, and where lots of tens of thousands of refugees were fleeing the country because of political instability. He didn't say anything. He just said, oh, it's a socialist experiment. Um, it's not for me to comment on whether it's right or wrong. And yet, a few days ago, in relation to Trump not uh, sort of failing to criticize the Charlottesville rallies for what it was, he actually said on Twitter, well, a political leader who fails to uh, sort of just fails to contend both sides is morally wrong and implicit and he fails to act on that very moral principle which he espoused just a few days later. I find this very hypocritical and actually quite concerning from some, for someone who is prized in his moral values. Thank you.
Does anyone want to speak in opposition of the motion? Hands up if you want to defend the left. I'm going to go down here. Uh, I am Sam. Um, so there's <laughs> two points here. Um, first of all, uh, sort of the speech made in proposition of the motion uh, entirely dealt with primarily uh, concerns over the leadership of the individual of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Jeremy Corbyn's competence is a, a separate debate to whether the left has lost its way. The left is a, a wide political movement. It's an international political movement, even if we do take an Anglo-centric perspective on this. Um, even if Corbyn has issues of competence, and I'm not going to get into whether he does or not because that's a separate debate, but even if he did, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the left has lost its way. That just means that there happens to be a person who's not very good at their job, um, which I don't really... Uh, is, uh, sort of stands up to the, sort of the very grand statement of the left losing its way. Uh, so I, I don't really feel that the speech... Um, as impassioned as it was talking about sort of the internal issues of the Labour Party, which I feel very strongly over as a sort of Labour activist and member, but I really don't think it answered the question of has the left lost its way. Uh, the second issue is um, the point of sort of, uh, on that note, uh, on that point you made uh, about uh, the manifesto as opposed to Brexit being sort of the reason why. Uh, YouGov did polling on this, um, and the manifesto was the lead reason why people voted Labour by a margin of about 13 points. Uh, Brexit was so insignificant, it didn't even feature amongst the headline. It was less than 3%. Uh, it, it featured in the other at the end of it, um, whereas for the Conservatives, it was the main reason. Uh, well, I think the second to main reason. maybe may have been the main second to main reason, but it was statistically insignificant in why Labour did well in the election. So I, I don't really... I think that's a, a relatively moot point. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, does anyone want to speak in abstention of the motion? Very enthusiastic at the back there. Hi, Emma Tin, Newnham College. So both speeches have either focused on present politics in Britain or on statistics and very much on how it reflects on the past and the present. But if we're doing a debate about a movement losing its way, then surely we need to think about the future path what on earth is going to be the effect on the left, for example, like climate change or the changing geopolitical situation across the globe? I think that in order to win this debate, both sides of the house need to look at this issue of the, of the future. Thank you, Emma. Um, we're going to move back now to the main debate. Uh, we'll try and do a few more floor speeches uh, in the second round between... Owen and, uh, yeah, Owen and, who's the name? Yes, Patrick and Eddie, or whatever, we'll work, I'll work out exactly. No, Owen and Eddie, good, sorry, I was, I was getting confused with my numbers. Uh, that's why you don't get a historian to do this job. Um, anyway, we're going to move on now to Flora, Flora Bowen. Um, Flora is a second year studying MML at Clare College, Cambridge. Last term, she served in the publicity team at the union, and she won the slot through an open audition. Flora, the floor is yours. So you've heard a lot of facts. I'm going to take a rather broader approach. Some might say vaguer. Let's stay with more global. <laughs> I'll start by talking a little bit about my own background and my relationship with the left. I'm the subject of Fox News's Roth and Ire. I am sure that if Donald Trump were to lay a finger on me, the seventh circle of hell, though that would be, he would probably be dissolved by his own hatred of me and everything I represent about the left. As an IVF baby, conceived through the NHS, that astonishing labour achievement, I owe my very existence to the success of Labour's project. As a member of a family whose origins are the valley mining towns of Wales and the industrial cities of Yorkshire and the Northeast, the workers' struggle is deeply important to me. 
I was born in Moseley, Birmingham, the only UK constituency to have voted in a communist candidate. Living in a house with the head of politics at, um, at Birmingham University, he was actually so communist, he, his phone was bugged during the Cold War. <coughs> I've been a member of the Labour Party and have campaigned for Labour since I was 16. Yet, in spite of my values, my upbringing and my background, I sincerely feel a great disillusionment with the failures of the left. The great promises of the left universally are democratising access to wealth, sharing resources, achieving fair and stable welfare states. This has failed. Look at our world as it stands. Data mined by vastly wealthy private companies. Tax avoidance on an industrial scale. A reverse Robin Hood of greed. The outsourcing of ensuring basic living standards to charities and NGOs, both in Britain and around the world. Extreme economic inequality. Environmental catastrophe caused primarily by, pow by powerful private companies. And what are the left doing anyway? Where is Jeremy Corbyn? Gardening. <laughs> he should be... S um, one moment. He should be sowing the seeds of discontent, not the seeds of marrow. If you'd like to make a point, I mean, sign up for the open auditions. <laughs> sure. Sure, the left has been with has been whipping up excitement at rallies, festivals, and then the popular, um, the popular mind. But everyone shouts at festivals and rallies. I've been to Leeds Fest several times, and frankly, everyone is so off their face, they'd orgasm if a potato was wheeled onto stage. <laughs> rallies and Facebook sharing doesn't translate into votes. What truly matters is power. Podemos, not in power. Our revolution, not in power. Labour, not in power. You can see where I'm going with this. Le Parti Socialiste, not in power. It's not just that the left have lost their way, but that they've been wandering around the forest for hours using an out-of-date GPS system. They're about to have to call their DOV supervisor to pick them up in the van a story that may or may not have been born out of personal experience. <laughs> Before you spit the words false dichotomy or moot point or something like this at me, I will say this. Of course, there's a balance between gardening and the communist revolution. But the left has not yet discovered it, and it may never until it is too late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Flora, for those words, um, very much indeed. We move on now to the second speaker on the opposition, Owen Dowling. Owen is a first-year historian at Robinson College, Cambridge. He won this slot through an open audition. Owen, the floor is yours. Good evening, comrades. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Hi, so yeah, I'm Owen, I'm a fresher here studying history at Robinson College, and I'm speaking in opposition to the motion that the left is losing its way. So, I'm a member of the Labour Party, of Momentum, and quite what you might call the Corbyn Project. I am a card-carrying member of the hard left. Back in the 2015 general election, politics felt pretty hopeless to me. The Tories were, of course, awful. 
but at the time, I couldn't see a great deal of difference between them and labor. It was, it seemed, austerity versus austerity light. Why wasn't there any sort of visible political alternative? Of course, a few months later, Jeremy Corbyn was elected by a landslide to leader of the Labour Party, which began a process of reinvigoration for the British left, which has been formative for me and my politics, especially as most of my political upbringing has been in the red heartland of the People's Soviet of Liverpool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for me, this isn't just a defence of a politics I agree with. It's a defence, and hopefully a vindication, of my friends and comrades, of our efforts, movement, and organization. And maybe I can convince a few of you tonight that the left is actually on the right path for the first time, certainly, in most of our lifetimes. So, recently, the World Transformed, a festival of left-wing ideas, was held alongside Labour Party conference in Liverpool. In many ways, it represented the modern left on debate here today. It was socialist, explicitly discussing alternative models of running our economy, it was militantly anti-racist, hosting events from Black Lives Matter, standing in solidarity with Palestine, planning anti-fascist strategy, and taking an introspective look at why anti-Semitism can crop up on the left and how to smash it whenever it does. It was in... Yes? Would you say part of the way that we could smash anti-Semitism on the left would be to remove Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party? <laughs> I would... Thank you for your question. I would not say that. I'd say that's quite an idealist analysis of the nature of anti-Semitism as a political phenomenon. I think it's a wider issue that we should look at on a more structural basis. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, the world transformed was also internationalist, welcoming socialists, trade unionists and dissidents from around the world, revolutionaries from Rojava alongside unionized nurses from the US. I argue this is not a left which has lost its way, but rather a left which after years in the centrist, neoliberal and intellectually bereft wilderness has found its way onto a better path. So during the second Labour Party leadership contest in 2016, Jeremy Corbyn spoke around the country including in Liverpool, where on a rainy Monday evening, 10,000 people came out onto St. George's Plateau to hear him speak. Of course, Liverpool has a famous socialist tradition. It's perhaps not surprising that so many people would come out to hear a genuinely socialist leader of the Labour Party speak, addressing poverty in the city, as well as paying tribute to the Liverpudlian struggles in the 80s against Thatcher's managed decline, and today against austerity, privatisation, and threats to our women's hospital. These sorts of events... Did these sorts of events did not just happen in Liverpool. Similar mobilisations in Manchester, Leeds, York, Stoke, Durham, London took place in the following weeks, and Corbyn with his socialist platform was re-elected as Labour leader, despite the efforts of some, shall we say, malcontents in the PLP and party bureaucracy to end this radical experiment. This is genuinely popular politics. It's true that rallies don't win elections by themselves but it's also true that popular political movements need to extend outside the Westminster bubble if they're to actively engage with communities and enact the transformative program we aim for. So yeah, the modern Labour Party, for the first time in decades, offers such a transformative agenda of reinvestment in our economy and society, of taking water, mail, energy, rail back into public hands, the abolition of tuition fees, increasing corporation tax, and orienting our economy to work for the many, not the few. La nope. Labour's shadow cabinet now has a record number of female and BAME MPs and through momentum and local community organising is serving as a force for anti-racism and feminism at branch level. The British left is not just about its leadership, of course. Within the party there are hundreds of thousands of skilled, engaged activists, some of the finest people I know. With local momentum branches organising reading groups for educating members on political economy, strategic canvassing and direct participation in party making. The British left has been mobilised like never before, bursting with creative energy, optimism and camaraderie. Though the revitalising dynamic of Corbyn's election to Labour leader 
the grassroots activist left has been engaged like it hasn't been for decades. I mentioned the Save the Liverpool Women's Hospital campaign, which has received solidarity from Diane Abbott and Emily Thornberry. But there's so much else. The Acorn Tenants Union, who do amazing work defending tenants from eviction, discrimination or abuse by landlords. The heroic anti-fracking campaigners in Preston, who recently faced jail for their activism. The RMT Railway Workers Union in its campaign to keep the guard on the train and so much else. These vitally important grassroots organizations play just as significant and informative a part as the part of the left as the official labor structures. So, this motion poses that the left is losing its way. To really emphasize why this is not the case, it might be useful to look at how some basic policy positions on the left have changed for the better since the days of new labor. Recently, UN poverty envoy Philip Olsen condemned the austerity measures of the Tories as having conflicted great misery on the British people with punitive, mean-spirited, and often callous policies driven by what he described as a political desire to undertake social re-engineering rather than economic necessity. 14 million people, 14 million, have been found to be living in poverty. Nope. The treatment of disabled people has been disgusting and will only get worse under universal credit. On the treatment of women, he said if you've got a group of misogynists in a room and said how can we make the system work for men and not for women, they wouldn't have come up with too many ideas that are not already in place. So, how has Labour responded to these outrages then and now? Under Ed Miliband, Labour did not challenge this appalling austerity and even recommended its MPs abstain in the vote over the government's welfare cuts in 2015 rather than vote against. Whether it resulted from genuine belief in austerity, from lack of political courage or anything else, this was a class betrayal of Labour's roots and its supposed purpose as the party of Labour against capital. Now, however, Labour is an avowedly anti-austerity party. Jeremy Corbyn has described austerity as a political choice, not an economic necessity, and Labour will give our starved economy the investment it needs. I will speak my God so quickly. Under, La no, no, no. under Labour, uh, under Blair, Labour opened Yarlsworth Detention Centre where there has been appalling racial and sexual abuse of migrants. Awesome. I'll, but now, of course, brief, brief, genuinely brief. Oh my God. <laughs> feel I'm free. I'm just so passionate, you know. No, no, feel free. Um, just to take, also, take your time. In 2014, anyway. Labour backed Theresa May's immigration bill, which brought in the hostile environment and led to the disgustingly racist Windrush scandal. Thankfully, Labour is no longer complicit in this. Diane Abbott, who has done some stellar work on migrants' rights, has pledged that Labour will shut down Yarlsworth Detention Centre and the government's hostile environment policy. On foreign policy, Blair and Labour, New Labour took us into a disastrous imperialist war in Iraq, which killed at least hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, led to the death of 179 British soldiers, and has only served to destabilise the region and facilitate the rise of ISIS. Socialism, if nothing, is not... Sorry, so, my God. Socialism is internationalist. And now, for the first time since perhaps Keir Hardy, the Labour has an avowedly anti-imperialist leader who has historically opposed reckless Western foreign policy and defended their rights to oppressed peoples in Kurdistan, Chile, South Africa, Ireland and Palestine. Having a Prime Minister on the UN Security Council in favour of Palestinian right of return and self-determination would be unprecedented. Historically, Britain has been complicit in the brutalisation of Palestine, so this is truly a, a turn for the better for the left on the international stage. In America, just to talk about the international stage quickly, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France, skipping paragraphs as I go. So quickly... <laughs> The left has found its way, but only at the 11th hour. During the First World War, Polish revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg popularized a phrase which gave insight into the seriousness of the crisis at the time. She said society was facing a choice between socialism or barbarism. This is an appropriate mantra for today. Our age is one of capitalist crisis, and the far right is on the rise all around the world. Across Europe, third way and social democratic parties are in disarray. In France, the increasingly unpopular President Macron has taken to honoring head of the Vichy regime, Nazi ally and Holocaust collaborator Marshal Pétain as an olive branch to the far right in his country. The centrist liberal consensus, which once held political hegemony after Fukuyama's end of history, was shattered by 2008, and no longer has the political impetus to see off the far right. Hillary Clinton, a candidate with decades of experience in the American establishment, who by all rights should have crushed the absurd character of Donald Trump, managed to lose. Only a left-wing politics which stands up to fascists on the streets, which challenges the neoliberal ideology which creates the conditions of desperation and alienation in which the far right thrives, and which offers a coherent alternative to both the far right and the moribund center can lead our politics out of this present crisis. Only the left realizes that the climate crisis is intimately tied up with corporate capital and offers a coherent and radical alternative of nationalization at home and transition to green energy in the, around the world. Very, very quickly I will say my final sentence. <laughs> The emergent left has the capability to deal with the present crisis. It is optimistic, it is thriving, and it is ready for power. It is not losing its way, it has it found the way, and it is the way. Thank you.
Thank you, Owen, for those passionate words. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, there was real passion there. Um, we're going to go around now to a uh, round of floor speeches. Um, if anyone would like to speak in proposition motion, please put your hand up. We're going to go around at least twice, because I know there's lots of people keen to speak on this one. I'm going to go down there. Yeah, go on nearest uh, you, Alex. Hello. Well, um, Owen, I won't, uh, I won't take you on too many points. Um, I would like to advise you, however, to open an A-level economics textbook and read why austerity is not simply a symbol of the left. It's, um, it's sorry, as an austerity, uh, as a political symbol, as an economic necessity, in fact. It's something that, with tuition fees, uh, the, to completely cut tuition fees would leave an enormous gaping hole uh, in our government's debt. It's simply uh, not economically feasible. Also, I'd just like to make a very quick point. Um, in Chinese sort of philosophy, dare I call it philosophy, uh, there is a concept of the way. <laughs> uh, well, no, 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 oh, no, no, this is, sorry, this is, no, I should explain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's in the sense that I study Chinese, and I'm uh, talking about the way. Uh, which is uh, led by um, our Taoist sort of uh, philosopher. Um, there's argument whether he's called a philosopher. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Of course. <laughs> in Chinese, uh, in this Taoist sort of idea, the, the way, the Tao, is something that cannot be seen. Um, and I think if the left is losing the way, I think it certainly is losing the Taoist way. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, uh, you do have a right to reply. Yeah, you can. Yeah, decide amongst yourselves who, or you can. You can double team, but make it make it brief. So thank you very much, Owen. I'm going to outsource my response to Dr. Bastano, but I would just like to say, on behalf of the Chinese people, thank you for your words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The rate of non-repayment is now so high that actually, and this is very well documented, the rate of non-repayment is so high that it's bordering now on a net negative to the exchequer. So there really is no argument to not abolish tuition fees. Even if you all uh, died in the wall neoliberal, this is a valuable piece of infrastructure. Human brains that are well developed create far more value in production than roads, bridges, power stations. There really is no argument not to have public funding of education all the way through to higher education. Um. I'm going to take a point in opposition. Again, could we try and keep this fairly brief, uh, very concise? I'm going to go upstairs. A minute, please, Cecily. Hi, Cecily Bateman, King's College. So this isn't going to be a kind of soliloquy or a sonnet to Jeremy Corbyn or even to the Labour Party because I think that's been done quite well below. But what I think the left is doing really well is they are pointing out how terrible the new normal and the new status quo we've had is. Because I know that we would love to complain about the government, um, but what we really don't want to think is how much suffering there is in this country. We don't want to acknowledge it because we think, how could this happen in a place that we love? How can this happen in a place where I live? But what we have seen and what has been acknowledged in the latest UN report is the really callous policies that have been pushed through, not just, not just in this last Tory government, but over at least the last, the last 10 years, possibly the last 15, that have resulted in the deaths of literally hundreds of disabled people. Food banks are the new normal in constituencies, even multiple food banks. And you don't have to believe in socialism to believe that this shouldn't be the new normal. And that obviously this status quo can be tackled by both parties and should be tackled by both parties. But currently Certainly, the left is the one pointing this out the most strongly, it, because it does need to be said, and people, because people are dying, and that is what we should really be considering. Thank you. Does anyone have a point in abstention of the motion? Down here, please. Richard Parkin, Strainter College. Is the microphone work? Yes, that's a Richard Parkins, Trinity College. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to congratulate Gabriel and Flora on giving two excellent speeches in favour of the motion that the Labour Party has lost its way. The Labour Party has indeed lost its way, and if that were the motion, I would vote for it. Um, however, the motion is that left has lost its way. Now, the hard left, like the poor, is always with us. It hasn't lost its way, it's trotting out the same tired old nostrums, nationalise everything, soak the rich, give lots of money to everybody from the magic money tree. 
<laughs> that it's always trotted out, and whenever they've been tried, they've failed, and whenever the Labour Party has been taken over by the hard left, it's made itself unelectable for a generation. So the left hasn't lost its way, like, as uh, Talleyrand said of the French monarchists, they've learned nothing and they've forgotten nothing. They're the same as they always were. The reason this country is in such a terrible mess is not only has the Labour Party lost its way, but the Conservative Party's lost its way as well. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, we're going to do another round of floor speeches, but I'm going to ask for brevity. Brevity, and I will intercede if that brevity is not being exercised. Um, does anyone want to speak in proposition of the motion? Alex, you can pick for me. No, it's your power. Go, go on, Alex. Um, just slander us more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Simon Warren at Trinity College. Um, even if we accept the arguments that the opposition have given us, that we must, even, even then we must accept that the left have lost its way. You gave wonderful speeches extolling the virtues of Jeremy Corbyn of Bernie Sanders, but it must be remembered that they lost. Those, these ideas have failed. They have not brought about the change that you are hoping for. Um. <laughs> You have to situate success or failure in context. And anybody that wins almost 10% more of the popular, sorry, increases their share of the vote by almost 10%, 9.6% in the case of Jeremy Corbyn, that's clearly an outstanding achievement. So I don't think you can call it a failure, especially in the broader context where Labour lost 6 million votes between 1997 and 2010. And furthermore, where the European centre left, and I think we can all agree on this because we can just open the news and read what's going on is dying on its knees. Clearly the outlier in Europe, broadly speaking, you can look at Sweden perhaps, you can look at Malta, Germany. is the outlier. Germany, well the SDP actually were polling 16% in February, so the Green Party, well they're not, they're not the historic party of the centre left, so that's compounding the point. Clearly, clearly there is a crisis of traditional social democracy in Europe. Clearly there was a long-term trend of failure. Both have been turned around and defined by Jeremy Corbyn. It's inarguable. And you can argue with that. I don't know why we're having the debate even. <laughs> it's um, data. Does anyone want to speak in opposition of the motion? Well, C Julia, I'm, I'm going to delegate this to you. The Yepper, yeah. You wait for the microphone. I know, I know you're eager to begin. I know, I know, but YouTube doesn't like that. Thank you. After, after being cut down by one of the propositions, I, I, I felt really inspired to make my point. And, and I'd like to make two points very quickly. The first of which is there seems to be some level of confusion on the proposition of this motion because they're simultaneously acknowledging that Jeremy Corbyn was democratically elected by members of the Labour Party and then complaining that he's unable to stamp out every single incidence of bad behaviour. Which one is it? The man is democratically elected through democratic party structures or he is a tyrant, he cannot be both. I think this is a willful misinterpretation of the role of the Labour Party which these people are well aware of, of how the party functions. Which is leading to this confusion that the second speaker for the proposition can have when they say that they want the democratisation of wealth in this country, but they are not willing to allow Labour Party members to democratically select their own MPs. Like, which one would you like to have? You cannot, again, have both. But the second point I'd like to make more is really, is, uh, is more about how the fact that no one in the proposition has mentioned the role of austerity in all of this. Corbynism did not start in 2015. It started in 2008 with a financial crisis. The result of austerity, as the United Nations has again highlighted, again, this has happened again and again, has caused hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths. The Lancet, a well-respected medical journal, 180,000 unnecessary deaths. But this, this, you can go further back to this. You can go to 2015, when LSE released a report that highlighted 
like pensioners eating dog food, people with like strokes having to walk five miles every single day to sign on the job centres. The role of austerity in punishing people for financial crisis they did not create has been well documented, well highlighted and well ignored by the right wing of the Labour Party. And I think in reality we should go back to 2010 where the first people who warned against the consequences of austerity in this country were the student movement. And whilst the police were battering those people in the head so hard that people were nearly killed that doctors warned that they were seeing repeats of Hillsborough-style injuries from the response of the Metropolitan Police, what was the response of the right wing of the Labour Party, which is what this debate is really on? It was the response of people like Aaron Porter, who said that those students had brought the movement into disrepute and who said that they should um, pursue the electoral route through the Labour Party. And where has that got us? Well, we've got absolutely nowhere pursuing the like, right-wing strategy of the Labour Party, who have lost every single election they've contested. But we've got much further by listening to the real people who are suffering as a consequence of that crisis in this country. And so I wonder whether really the question we're asking this evening is not whether the left has lost its way, whether the left are accurately responding to the fact that over a million people are on food banks, but whether the right-wing of the Labour Party have forgotten the body count of austerity and why we urgently need a change of course in this country. Gabriel, you've got 15 seconds. That the proposition, I think I speak for all of us, are somehow ignoring austerity. You know, I mean, I think both sides of the House are completely united in wanting to fight that and, you know, criticising the right of the Labour Party, the role of new Labour in reducing child poverty and improving the lives of millions of people in this country, I think is incontrovertible. Um, <laughs> And when it comes to democracy within the Labour Party, when it comes to democracy within the Labour Party, obviously MPs have to be accountable in some form to party structures, but it creates a tension between direct democracy within the party, which can lead to tyranny of the majority, and representational parliamentary democracy in Britain, which underpins our constitution. I'm trying to find a balance. I'm not trying to destroy one or the other. Yeah, well... <laughs> completely open to discussions about changing of that and so on and so forth, as long as it's done in the public sphere in spirited debate. I, I, it's, I just think that's nitpicking if you want the truth. You know, I mean, let's cross the hurdles one by one. Come on. Yes, well, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that first past the post is this absolutely wonderful system and, you know, the establishment is brilliant. No member of the Labour Party wanders around advocating endless continuity, for goodness sake. We're all radicals in some form. Come on. I, mean, I wouldn't say I'm nitpicking. I'm saying you're uh, sort of picking and choosing when my, the example suits. I'm not so picking and choosing. I'm trying to balance both sides of the argument. My, my. I'm trying to find some form of common ground, despite my Gabriel, hyperbolic Gabriel, term. Gabriel Butchers, I enjoyed discussing intricacies of the electoral system. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> my apologies. I will happily take a point in abstention of the motion. Um, I'm going to go to the back there. But thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, is this on? Okay. I think socialism as a whole has a lot to do with Owen's speech. It's a lot of promises. It's really fast, but it doesn't really get anywhere. And I just kind of wanted to see the opposition sort of discussing the reality of socialism, what's actually going on in Venezuela, and what would it be if, they, if it actually gets us to our reality. I just want to see facts and numbers. Socialism hasn't worked. Socialism has made people leave their country. Many people have to. I, I come from a system that socialism, I, I come from the product of socialism. I see many people die and many people losing their homes and their life. I just think it's quite unfair to discuss socialism while you're in Cambridge and quite comfortable in a system that works without actually showing the system. So if Venezuela is not socialism, then has socialism used it this way? Because Spain, Podemos, is using Venezuela as a benchmark for what socialism used to be. So what's, what's the truth then? Thank you for, for those remarks um, there. Thank you for everyone who contributed. Thank you for the heated nature of that debate. That was excellent. You, of course, do have the right to interject, and I will be asking both of our last two speakers, since there were lots of people who wanted to make their voices heard there, if somebody does stand up, obviously it's, it's your right, um, but it might be quite nice to accept at least one. Um, that would be, that'd be much appreciated, and I'm sure Alicia will be a little bit more generous with the time, if that is the case. We're going to move on now to our final speaker.
for the proposition, um, Eddie Marsden. Eddie Marsden is an actor and a proud centre-left activist. He's currently working a lot for the People's Vote campaign. Though he is best known for featuring in high-profile films such as Deadpool and Sherlock Holmes, he's risen to recent political prominence on Twitter. He's been very vocal about the Labour Party on anti-Semitism in Europe. And just today, he's received his honorary doctorate from the University of East Anglia. So, <laughs> Dr. Marsden, the floor is yours. <laughs> It, um, it honestly is such an honor to be here. I really am chuffed to be invited. Um, Anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools. That saying is attributed to Ferdinand August Babel, the 19th century social democrat. And he said the socialism is the socialism of, that anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools because unlike any other races, the anti-Semite thinks that he is shooting upwards to an all-powerful Jewish conspiracy that he is convinced exists. It is a very pernicious and a seductive racism to some on the left because it is often portrayed as egalitarianism. We are threatened at the moment by the rise in populism, where simple lies are trumping complex truths. Pardon the pun. The world is changing, and the pace of change fueled by globalization and technology is is increasing and unrelenting. But globalization isn't a policy and it isn't a conspiracy, it's an inevitability. Now many of us in this room will ride the wave of globalization and will reap its benefits. But there are many others like members of my family and people from the community where I come from who won't reap these benefits and they're in danger of being flooded and overcome by this wave. The great challenge for us as a society and a species is to guarantee that as many people as possible can reap the benefits of globalization at the same time as mitigating the costs both economically and environmentally. But populism is a retreat from this challenge. It's, it's fear of change itself, it's anti-intellectualism, it's fear of complexity, it's simple lies trumping complex truths. Now we're all very aware of the populism of the right, the xenophobia, the racism, the Islamophobia. But there is also a populism of the left, and though it comes from good intentions and the right questions, i.e. how do we tackle inequality, its answers and its solutions are often as parochial and as regressive as those on the right. Then the clearest indication of populism of the far left is anti-Semitism. The socialism of fools. Nye Bevin said, the language of priorities is the religion of socialism. And in the last summer before Brexit, the Labour Party, under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn, decided that its priority was not to hold the Tory government to account as it tore itself apart over the lies of Brexit. Instead, it chose to fight an internal battle over the universally recognised IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And Corbyn said that this is to guarantee that people have the right to criticise the State of Israel over its treat treatment of the Palestinians. But the IHRI definitions specifically say the criticism of Israel, similar to that level to any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. Thousands of members of the Jewish community and their supporters gathered outside the Houses of Parliament last year to stage an unprecedented protest against the rise in anti-Semitism. And what was Jeremy Corbyn's response? Did he respond to these concerns by reaching out to the wider Jewish community? No. He decided to attend a Passover group with a left a Passover dinner with a left-wing group, Jewish group called Judas, which said that the anti-Semitic allegations were a lie and that the people organizing the protest were in league with the Conservative Party and the right wing of the Labour Party. Now compare for a moment the way that Jeremy Corbyn has dealt with the anti-Semitism issue in the Labour Party with the way that Barack Obama dealt with the Jeremiah Wright scandal when he was a candidate for the President of the United States. Like Corbyn, Obama was doing well in the polls when all of a sudden ABC released footage of a sermon that he attended. There was a sermon given by his pastor, Jeremiah Wright. Now in this sermon, Jeremiah Wright said, and he criticized the way the Americans treated African Americans. And he finished this, the sermon with the words, God damn America, rather than God bless America. 
And many people thought that this would derail Obama's presidency, President Cant his candidacy. They thought that it would destroy it. But five days after that broadcast, he stepped on stage and he gave what many people say is the seminal speech of race in American presidential history. And it's a speech called A More Perfect Union. And in that speech, he spoke of the difficulties of dealing with the legacy of, Tom, of Jim Crow, of, of segregation, of slavery. He spoke of his personal difficulties in growing up in a house of mixed parentage and hearing members of his family casually speak words of bigotry and racism. But what he did was he showed leadership, honesty, and courage. And he went on to win the presidency. But what did Jeremy Corbyn do? He retreated back to those who agreed with him. He retreated back to the adulation of his supporters. And he didn't reach out to the wider people as a whole. Now, I voted for Jeremy Corbyn. I voted for Jeremy Corbyn in the last election, and I voted Labour in every general election. I passionately believe in social housing because I was raised in a community that benefited from it. I think austerity is Tory ideology. I think it is awful, but I don't think that you, sir, or your faction have a monopoly on that. I passionately believe in the NHS. My mother died this year after receiving fantastic care from the hospitals of Basildon and Southend. I believe that it is the government's responsibility to give everybody the facilities by which they can fulfill their potential. I believe in a meritocracy, and I don't believe that ca capitalism unfettered can provide for a meritocracy. That's why I've always voted Labour, because I believe we need government intervention and a certain redistribution of wealth to guarantee a meritocracy. That's why I believe in the northern European models of social democracy. But Jeremy Corbyn has rejected that model. For 40 years, he has been a passionate Eurosceptic. Before he became leader of the Labour Party, his voting record on Europe was exactly the same as Kate Hoy's. When there was an EU referendum campaign, he refused to share the platform with other pro-Remain Labour politicians because he didn't agree with them, which I find really strange because he often apparently shares platforms and goes to services with people that he doesn't necessarily agree with. Point of order, or whatever it's called, I don't know. Um, while we obviously agree, I think there's two points that need to be made, Eddie, within comradeship, of course. Firstly, that <laughs> while we can have disputes about the tactics and the policy with which we can approach it, I don't think socialists shall have anything to say to the European Union, the greatest strategy for the implementation of neoliberalism across Europe. And secondly, he didn't just disagree with Tony Blair. Tony Blair killed a million people. I think any socialist should be disgusted to be on a platform with him on the same level as it would with George Bush or any such individual. Brexit is self-destructed populism. It is the domain of ideologues and charlatans. It may have originated in the failure of successive conservative leaders to deal with the xenophobic ideologues of their own party. But it is also the orthodoxy of many on the far left. Now, the right-wing Brexiters believe that a free market utopia will rise from the ashes of destruction. And left-wing Brexiters believe that a socialist utopia will rise from the ashes of destruction. But what they both agree with is that destruction is a price worth paying. That's why Corbyn and John McDonnell don't want to stop Brexit, they want to capitalise on it. Surely the Labour Party should be exposing the lies and false promises that underpin Brexit, but no. Their policy is to come up with more lies, to claim, in contradiction with the EU, that Labour could guarantee that we can still leave and yet enjoy the same benefits, that there is such things as a job-first Brexit. Now, when it comes to Europe, Corbyn is as out of step with the young people who support him as Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage. But his back backers in the press, like Owen Jones and Matt Zarb Cousin and who's that, um, Paul Mason, 
They have fought a vicious rearguard action and attacked anyone who has threatened to expose Corbyn's vulnerability. Any time Tony Blair makes a coherent and eloquent argument against Brexit, the loudest jeers are not from Tories, but from Corbyn supporters screaming war criminal in the hope that it will drown out his message and prevent anyone comparing it to Corbyn's inarticulacy and ambiguity. And even if you do believe that Tony Blair's record on Iraq disqualifies him from public de debate, and bear in mind, I marched against the Iraq war. Then consider this. Andrew O'Donnell, Lord O'Donnell, a fantastic advocate for the people's vote. Lord O'Donnell, son of an immigrant, raised in care, worked hard and through his hard work and his intelligence went to Oxford. Now, Corbyn supporters dismiss Andrew O'Donnell as a member of the elite. They dismiss me as a member of the elite. My old man was a lorry driver. My mum was a school teacher's assistant. My nan was a cleaner. I was brought up in a, on a council estate. I mean, our Lord probably is a member of the elite. For fairness. Um, my father was a, uh, worked in a kebab shop. If I was ever elevated to the House of Lords, I'm pretty sure I'd be a member of the British establishment. Very good. <laughs> I never made a living as an actor until I was 30. But the far left and the far right call me a member of the elite. They say that I'm a traitor to my class. I'm not a traitor to my class. I'm a traitor to their definition of my class. <laughs> there is a narcissistic narrative that is prevalent amongst the most privileged members of the far left, and it is this. They rescue us. They don't empower us. We don't do anything for our own volition. They define us. They define our class. And we must stay within that definition. And if we transcend it in any way, then we are traitors to it. And this is why the far left of the Labour Party has always had a difficult relationship with the aspirational working class, because they see the aspiration as purely economic, when in fact it's not. From first-hand experience, I know that it's psychological. It is a response to the chaos of poverty, and it is the need to have a sense of autonomy over your life. Now, you, I tell you where you see this the most. When you see Corbyn and his supporters trying to suppress or even block the campaign for a people's vote, they know that people will lie to over Brexit, but they don't want to give people the facts and enable them to make an informed choice on the most important issue facing this country for 50 years. No, they know what's best for us. And it's Corbyn's lifelong dream of a UK independent of the EU, a socialist UK. And even if they have to lie to get it, they'll do it. Now, this proves that far-left populism is the same as far-right populism. It's manipulative, it's based on lies, it's undemocratic, it's authoritarian, and its priority is its ideology and not the people that it's there to serve. Thank you very much, Eddie, for those words. I have received one message which has been sent through, uh, sent through to me via the Union Facebook page. And this, I believe, is a uh, point in proposition from Luke Hallam. Um, <laughs> my contribution is that when the Institute for Fiscal Studies analyzed the 2017 Labour Manifesto, they were planning on keeping 70% of Osborne's 2015 benefit cuts. Surely a socialist party for which this is the case has lost its way somewhere. <laughs> if anyone can type a cogent response to that and message the Facebook page, I will happily read that out afterwards, um, or an abstention. Um, we move on now to our final speaker on, in opposition of the motion, uh, Patrick Gubelage. Patrick is a first-year PhD student at, in electrical engineering at Downing College, Cambridge. He won this slot through an open audition. Patrick, the floor is yours. Um, yeah. 
So, um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the floor speakers we've had so far for introducing the concept of internationalism to this debate, and also to my colleague before. And uh, I'd like to thank Hadi for making my job exceedingly difficult. Um, and uh, I think that uh, precisely because of Eddie, I will feel somewhat comfortable talking about the far left, as he has uh, been presenting it. So, first of all, I'd like to say that debate is quite timely. We had US midterm election two weeks ago, where people openly campaigned as self-declared socialists and were not subject to an impromptu citizen's arrest. In some cases, such as that of Mesa Ocasio-Cortez mentioned earlier, they've even ended up winning a seat in the US House of Representatives while campaigning as democratic socialists. In Europe, previously called loony left parties, such as the Coalition of the Radical Left, or better known as Syriza, have won elections and formed governments, an event which in the Greek language stood as a euphemism for when pigs fly. There is a rise of new parties describing themselves as socialist, such as elements of Die Linke in Germany and Levitsa in Slovenia, which get 10% or so seats in parliament, while being bombarded by some media as trying to bring back gulags and totalitarianism. And at this point, I'd like to thank the speaker up there for bringing about the SPD in Germany, and to my colleague for bringing about how low they're actually polling. So, why in the UK and worldwide are these people suddenly being elected just because they throw words such as, such as socialist into their manifestos, into their campaigns, into their categorization, specifically compared to more traditional, um, well, let's call it traditional, I don't think they're very traditional leftists, um, but let's call it the parliamentary left, such as embodied by the Blairite wing of the Labour Party, the SPD in Germany, or France's Parti Socialiste, which the only thing it shares with socialism is really the name. These new parties have advocated, um, as in the new Syriza, Podemos, they have associated themselves with socialist policies, such as nationalization of key industries, an end to austerity, and uh, my esteemed colleague uh, who gave the floor speech will be delighted to know that uh, several Nobel Prize winning economists disagree with him on austerity. Oh, no. All of the proposition seems to be arguing on the idea that there's some sort of massive wave of austerity that's been sweeping over Britain. But this, factually speaking, is not true. I'm not saying that the Tories have not done some terrible things, because I frankly think they have. I think they have behaved in a very uncaring manner in the way that they've applied benefit cuts, etc. But they have, factually speaking, not implemented the mass scale of austerity you, uh, you all speak of. Public spending in Britain has risen year on year, every single year of Conservative government. We are now in a situation where the tax bill in the whole of Britain has not been as high as this since 1969. This has not been a massively austerity Tory government. It's been a Tory government that has made cuts in the wrong places because it doesn't care about working people and because it's made damaging cuts rather than taking tough decisions. But we are not in a country where austerity has completely taken over. And frankly, I don't think uh, that people would be time. willing, frankly, I don't think people would be willing to pay even higher taxes in the solution that you are proposing. Well, while the total number may be the case, everything has to, of course, always be charged against inflation. And while there are cases, uh, as you've said, the total spending, might not have gone down, it has gone down against inflation. All pay rises, such as that for the nurses and scraping of bursaries, and decreased funding for the NHS. You put l there's more people using the NHS, you put less money into it, and then you complain that it works worse. That, to me, does not strike me as surprising, but it strikes a large number of the Tory party as such. If you make cuts to the most vital services, the ones which are used by the most vulnerable of the population, which form the most of the population, can you say that these are not austerity measures? 
Can you say that when these people are deprived and their quality of healthcare decreases, when they have to use more food banks, that these are not austerity implementations? If your definition is total spending, not judged against inflation, maybe that's not austerity. But by any workable definition of the impact of the people, this was austerity. So, moving on, uh, going on from, you know, uh, at the end of austerity, these new parties have wanted to decrease military spending, generally increase workers' rights, which in Austria are right now under attack. The Austrian government has, as of today, debated a bill which would allow a 12-hour workday and up to 60-hour work weeks. And these new parties have also campaigned for more social support and free higher education. These platforms have all been abandoned by the so-called center-left. In Germany specifically, the SPD went into a coalition with Merkel's Christian Democrats, helped implement austerity measures, voted to increase military spending, strengthened police surveillance and police powers, and some of its senior members even defend Holocaust apologists such as Georg Baberowski at Humboldt University against attacks from what is called the far left. In Britain, we are all too familiar with the rise of Tony Blair's new labor, considered by Thatcher herself as one of her own greatest achievements. <laughs> they carried out privatizations, started the door on the privatization of the NHS in, twen in 2006 with the PFI bill, and cut so, some social spending, and particularly, again, introduced tuition fees to universities. The leftovers from that period are still strongly supporting acts of war in Parliament today. So I would argue that the proposition's idea of the left is not really left, and it is not left because it's not what the left's historic ideals of anti-war, of um, education for all, of meritocracy for all were, and it's not what the left historically fought for. Thank you for that point. Because, the, uh, because Tony Blair's new labor has failed in that even more than what you accuse of Jeremy Corbyn's new new labor. Meanwhile, Bloomberg reports that while productivity has steadily been increasing, compensation for workers has started to fall further and further behind that productivity. UPS, for example, one of the world's largest shipping companies, refuses to give more than a 1% salary increase, 2% below American inflation, while posting a quarterly profit rise of 20% and buying back $750 million of stock. That is the reason why people are attracted to new politics that promise, them new, that promise them representation in the form of socialism, in the form of a moving away from the capitalist state of the world. Well, perhaps the answer in this debate seems obvious. We have mentioned the likes of... A, uh, so, sorry. so who is there to carry out the demands of the working class for increased wages, better rights, and better education? The opposition would have us believe it is the Labour Party as such, without Jeremy Corbyn and without the slight left swing he actually introduced in modern-day politics, which are the result of grassroots demands from the working class and from young people. On the note of accusing him, um, and I apologize for the quote here, as a racist fucking anti-Semite, Jeremy Corbyn has repeatedly, by the media, especially in Haaretz, there were two articles in the beginning of September, uh, posted by the Haaretz, his criticism of the Israel-Palestine conflict has repeatedly been tried to characterize as anti-Israel equals anti-Semitism. That is not true. As an example, I would present the Jewish State Bill, uh, as an example, I would present the Jewish State Bill, which was criticized widely in Israel by the former heads of Mossad as be, uh, not just outside of Israel. So, sorry, so, 
With J Jeremy Corbyn and me running out of time, for example, I'll have to rush. <laughs> Thanks for that. But what I, want to say, what I actually wanted to say by giving all these examples forward that there is a working class surge, there is a youth surge of renewed interest in genuine socialist policies. These people want to have more representation at the actual level. The right wing of the Labour Party, which unfortunately this debate has been somewhat confined to, has failed in this immeasurably and has actually brought forward the surge that they are speaking, that we are today speaking about. Syriza in Greece has implemented the worst austerity measures in Europe, betraying their mandate on which they were specifically elected and just implemented the directions from Brussels. Podemos as well, together with the Socialist Party of uh, Spain, is trying to bring about the same. And Jeremy Corbyn itself, himself has, has been opposed to the efforts to expel the right-wing elements from the Labour Party itself. Right now, uh, you were accusing them, I believe, of, um, you know, consp of uh, conspiring to be without a Europe, and yet John McDonnell is going around the city asking for the blessing for the new budgets. So, what I really want to say, and leave you here with this, is that the workers and youth in expressing their support for Jeremy Corbyn, for, the peop uh, for Ocasio-Cortez, for Die Linke in Germany, for Levitsa in Slovenia, are fed up with the politics of the likes of Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and these people are the ones who are not losing the left's way, but they are instead showing the left the way towards genuine socialism, which will not be brought about by the Labour Party that the proposition speaks of, but instead by actual change from the people, from the working class, pressuring their politicians. And this is what we see as an expression in the new Labour Party of Jeremy Corbyn. So, in the description, I believe, we were accused of as being backward-looking. So, let's look back. The inequality levels in Britain are the worst since 1940, but we are backward-looking and populist because we demand immediate radical intervention. More than 16 million people in the UK have less than 100 quid in savings, yet we are backward-looking when we demand immediate intervention. More than 8 million people in the UK struggle to put daily food on the table, of which 4 million often forgo a day without a meal. So I would urge you that in view of this, the left, as understood as the millions of workers and youth, surging support for new, politic, uh, for new politics is not losing its way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, that draws our debate this evening to a close. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you to all of our speakers in the main debate. Thank you to all of our speakers from the floor. Um, just a few final points. Just thank you to all the stewards, etc. cetera. Um, tomorrow is the day of the union elections. The polls open at 8 o'clock online. Uh, use your democratic mandate. Vote. Uh, that, that means tonight is my last time in the chair. We have one more debate next week, the presidential on the grammar schools. Tomorrow we have the Prince of Monaco. We also have a, a panel event on women and terrorism featuring the UK head of the anti-terrorism police. We have Sol Campbell and David Moyes also speaking. Tonight we vote on our feet. We vote on our feet. So the motion before House is this House believes the left has lost its way. If you want to vote in favor of the motion, go through the eyes door. That's the door on your right. If you want to vote in abstention, through the middle. If you want to vote no, on the left. The results will be announced in the bar after the debate. Good night and have a good one. <laughs>